Podcasters Roundtable, Round 62, RSS feeds, podcasting RSS feeds, of course. And I mean, RSS feeds, they're the core of podcasting, right? So without one, you really don't have a podcast. So today we're going to discuss everything, well, hopefully a lot about RSS feeds as they relate to podcasters. That said, I'm counting on those watching live. I don't know this one, we have maybe a small turnout, but that puts extra pressure on the chat room to bring up issues and thoughts, questions, ideas about RSS feeds that we don't mention. And the rest will be handled by the round table. I know they are very capable. So we're looking forward to that. And if you're new to the round table, uh, it's probably important for me to mention that the goal of this show really is to be more than a how to show. So these topics that we discuss, they affect podcast producers yourself on a daily basis. And we want to learn from the experience of podcasters who have their hands on all aspects of their show, right? You're not just sitting behind the microphone. And so we try to approach each topic from all the angles and see pretty much what shakes out because one of the cool things, but also challenging things about podcasting is that everyone has a different approach and there are almost no rules or standards. Although I think we might hit a few today, which should be interesting. Uh, and we want to discuss those differences and have you, the audience, take away the approach that best suits your production style, um, production needs, your vision that you have for your own show. And then, of course, we want you to come back and share it with us on the roundtable. So in lieu of that, go over to podcastersroundtable.com right after this. Or if you're listening on the audio-only show, maybe right there on your link on your phone, not while you're driving, of course, and sign up to appear on a future round. And then let me know what podcasting topic you want to talk about. So let's go ahead and meet today's roundtablers. The lineup starting on the far left, my far left, co-host Daniel J. Lewis. Welcome back. Thank you. RSS is one of those things that I think people are like, huh? Even just what RSS stands for is often misunderstood. Oh, Actually. I didn't even have that one on my list, even though, yeah, that's good. You're going you're gonna to be first up with that one. Uh, Crystal, returning roundtabler, welcome back. Hello, Ray. Thanks for having me again. I'm going to, you know what's cool about Google Hangouts on Air is that you actually do, via the Control Room app, have control over each person's audio level. So that's pretty cool for us as podcasters. And behind the scenes, I'm sort of tweaking it to make it just perfect for the end listener, of course. No, I'm just anal about it. But yes, for you guys. All right, returning roundtabler, Sean, welcome back. Hi, Ray. I'm uh, so glad to be back on Podcasters Roundtable. I didn't think I'd make it twice in a year, so I'm really excited to be here. That's twice in the same year, huh? Indeed, yeah. All right. Uh, good memory, and it's been a long year. We're at the very end. If you're listening to this in the future, it's December 10th, 2015, 2015. So that's our little place in time, ramping up to Christmas. So it's so awesome to be able to get people to actually come over to the round table and spend some time with us because it's tough. It was tough to get a lineup. And, you know, in because of that, before we meet the new round tabler, uh, Crystal and Sean, I was trying to avoid the Lipsons, the Blueberries, the Spreakers. I was trying to avoid those hosts, right? Because we are going to talk a little bit about that and people will see some bias, but even we all have bias as a podcaster. You use what you use, but at least I have the tech people, right? I have the people who have their hands, like the podcasters who have their hands on all aspects of the show. These are the, you know, Crystal and Sean are, are the real, they're turning wrenches. They're not marketing, right? So we have not the marketing people, we have the tech people and that's what we want. So I think... I think that's good. And I had to call in ringers. Let's face it. I'll tell you, when I looked at the sheet for the sign-up sheet, no one's putting RSS feeds to discuss. That was not their topic that they wanted to discuss. So I called in some ringers, Crystal, who works behind the scenes at Libsyn, Sean, who works behind the scenes at Blueberry, going to help us out. But we have a new roundtabler, Stargate Pioneer. Welcome to the roundtable. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here, and I'm so excited that my first topic is RSS. <laughs> you got you got trapped, I think, on this one because I always set a trap. I usually ask a question on Google Plus. I'll say, "Hey, what do you guys use for to create your RSS feed?" I see who responds, and then someone has an interesting response. I'll probably say, "Hey, co come on over to the roundtable. I trapped you. We got you. You have something to say." And you have a couple different services you use for hosting. I think so. We're going to approach it from. Uh, as far as you're concerned, that's what you're going to get to talk about. And then, of course, interject. Anytime this is a roundtable, you're allowed to interrupt. 
But, you know, I have to ask, Stargate Pioneer, and that's, that's not your real name? No, it's not, not. I have to not use my real name for work purposes, so my friends call me SP. It's a lot easier than Stargate Pioneer, but I'm a sci-fi guy, so I kind of like the Stargate Pioneer name, but yeah, just call me SP. Will do. That's actually, man, I'm just dying to know what, what you do, but you know what? That's a topic uh, for another roundtable, I think, because you're not the first to come on and sort of be, uh, sort of have another name to really disguise your real name because of work. So I'm very interested in that. Uh, Daniel, write that one down. We got to do that one. <laughs> and that means I get to pick a new name. That's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, man, I don't have to Google rank for no, a new no, no, name. No. You, you don't get to pick your own name. Other people oh. pick the name for you. Oh, That's how it my works. Goodness. That sounds dangerous, to be honest with you. And I've had plenty of people call me names uh, that I don't want to go with <laughs> over the years. <laughs> All right. So since Daniel brought it up, I'm going to dive right in here. Uh, RSS, what's it stand for, Daniel? Rich Site Summary. No, not R true. Not not true. <laughs> it's not what, it's it not what I said. It is really simple syndication. It's what makes syndication really simple. But RSS does not actually stand for really simple syndication. So please stop telling people RSS stands for really simple syndication. No, it stands for Rich Site Summary. I, I think I can only remember... <clears throat> Uh, the former, the real simple syndicate. It's like in there, right? I mean, I'm even guilty of that myself. So I don't know, Crystal, do you agree? Is that what you call it? Do you refer I'm, to it as I'm rich site summary? guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's everybody's called it uh, really simple syndication for even when I worked in web hosting. So I have seen the other terms flown around, but guilty as charged. Now, Daniel, okay, you opened up a can of worms. That is going to make me say, you know, should we talk about the history a little bit? Do you give us, can you give us a brief history of RSS, a podcast RSS? Dave Weiner, Adam, uh, wait. Curry. Curry, yes. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I, Dave, Dave really coding it. I think there was someone else. I don't know, Crystal, Sean, any of you guys know any other people involved? Or is it just Dave? I, my... Uh... My understanding is it was pretty much the work of, of Dave Weiner. He was the one who, you know, in conjunction with Adam Curry, kind of came up with the whole idea for RSS 2.0 that included the specs for enclosure, so, you know, the media stuff, so an RSS feed could actually deliver a media file. That was pretty much my understanding. It was pretty much the two of them, obviously with Dave Weiner really hand, handling the, the coding side of it. Yeah, um, you know, sounds close to me. And there's, a, you know, the problem is history is a tough one, right? It's who's writing it, and it, it seems to change each time you go and look for it. But that's that's how we know it. Birth of this amazing medium, and, and look where we are today, right? Sitting on a Google Hangout. Ten years, what are we, gosh, 11? How far are we along? 11 years? 11. 2004, what year is this? Yeah, 11. You really want to say because Google? because Lipson's 11 years old. Hmm. What's that, SB? You really want to say a, a Google Hangout on Air is an RSS feed? No, I just said, look where we are now. Yeah. Maybe that's the whole point. Yeah. We're done with RSS. Google is? No, I don't know. We're, we're going to talk about that for sure. We're going to see, is Google done uh, with RSS? They seem to not be very friendly, but they're getting back into the game as far as podcasts go, and they're going to be taking RSS feeds. What they're going to do with them who knows? I I feel like I've already opened that can up too far. Let's talk about it. I mean, does does Google dislike RSS? I don't know how that even started. <laughs> I, I can understand people saying, oh, Google doesn't update FeedBurner or Google is letting FeedBurner die. A while back, Google did end Google Reader, which was an RSS reader service. Their reason was pretty simple. They said, not enough people are using this for us to continue focusing on it. And with other tools coming out that were much better, like Feedly and, and other tools, they then uh, decided to sunset Google Reader. And that was really the only RSS thing they killed. They have actually updated FeedBurner. Uh, they updated the limit for RSS feeds in FeedBurner from half a megabyte to a full megabyte. So it's not like FeedBurner is a forgotten project. They updated it. And the way they updated it makes me think it's future-proofing FeedBurner. And I'm just looking for them to update FeedBurner with um, Google Play Music 
uh, compatibility. Like you, you'll see something in there, and that will really show they're not giving up on feed burner. But I don't know where this thought comes from, really. Well, I mean, they had. I also had Google Listen, which they went away with. Now that may be a different story altogether. They might. You know, that was when we said they just don't care about podcasts. It wasn't even that good in the beginning or to start with. Uh, Angelo Mondato, uh, we're getting more blueberry people here, is in the chat room. And he actually uh, says something that was very confusing to me for a while. Google tried to replace RSS with a format called Atom. So Atom feeds. So I remember being on Blogger, creating my feeds, and I was like, do I use Atom? Or what is, what are all these different options? I don't understand, right? So does anyone else remember Atom feeds? I do. My uh, first, you... my first uh, real foray into, I don't know, CMSs or, or blogging was movable type when I uh, rolled my own installation of it, and it had support for RSS and Atom. And I remember at the time looking at them both and going, okay, do I really need both of these? Because you had to go into, you know, kind of the guts of the thing to make changes to make sure that those feeds were all accessible to people. And I remember asking some of my friends who I thought were a bit more savvy than me, like, can I just go with RSS? Do I need to do most of this? And, you know, for the most part, they said, ah, you can just stick with RSS and Adam's not that big of a deal. And then when uh, Blogger came around and seemed to rely, I think at the start anyway, it relied only on Adam feeds. I could be wrong about that. So that was another thing, and then obviously if you want to run a podcast site through Blogger, then you have to use FeedBurner, and you would have to use FeedBurner to turn an Atom feed into an RSS feed and all that kind of stuff, which I, I don't know how much of that's true now, but it was in the past. So I can kind of see maybe where that reputation started with uh, you know Google trying to subvert RSS with Atom feeds. Yeah, I wonder what the motivation would be. Go, uh, Angelo says that Google Listen ended with Google Reader as Google Listen used Google Reader for subscription management. So it was kind of tied together there. Uh, kill one, kill the other. And so I was curious, since we started off with that, I'm going to go backwards a little bit. And I'm curious as to how everyone on the round table and, of course, in the chat, which I already see someone says they're using PodPress, which is scary. And uh, I want to know how you're creating your... RSS feed. So Daniel, I mean, you have multiple shows. Are you doing all the same thing for an RSS feed for all the shows? Yes. And that's PowerPress for all of okay. them. Now, most of them go through FeedBurner still, but that's FeedBurner in its raw state, like so raw that it's essentially not FeedBurner. Well, what does that mean then? I'm not using any of the options in FeedBurner. So really the deadliest part of FeedBurner is SmartCast, the thing that people are told to use. That's horrible. And there are some other bad things like- Well, isn't that, the thing, isn't that the thing that used to give us the iTunes tags? Yeah, that is what used to be required to turn an RSS or an Atom feed into a podcast feed. You don't have to use that anymore if you use good feed creation tools. But um, it's now the thing that messes up your podcast feed as well as the download stats that FeedBurner provides. But I just have FeedBurner still as just a, a slight caution and just I haven't felt like moving completely off of it yet. But it's in its raw vanilla state. PowerPress is generating everything for me. Well, I mean, and so you definitely hope that FeedBurner stays around. I mean, it just present, uh, prevents just the pain of, of dealing with all of that. I mean, we all do hope it stays around has just been all these sort of signals that you know lately or actually lately like you said they updated it finally a little bit so there's a glimmer of hope i mean it would just it would be a big problem for rss and podcast and everyone who uses it so we hope that that doesn't go away that google play uh aspect seems that'll be interesting to see how that that goes crystal you have a couple shows or at least one are you no you're on two at least how are you creating your your feed <laughs> well of course my primary is Lipson because i work there and i like knowing what our users are using but i do test with uh blueberry and feed burner as well so um, those are usually my two primary forms is blueberry and Lipson. nice know your enemy <laughs> just kidding yeah, it's no, not an enemy i don't get hey, it i don't get i know that. that's I am not my thing I'm totally. If it, if it works, it works. I've I've got opinions on it, but it's not. Yeah. 
No, and we'll we'll hit on a little a little bit about that. I mean, there are so many ways and services to create your RSS feed, and you've heard that one. You know, one you you may have heard that Blueberry is is better because you own it, or that Libsyn is better because for some other reason, whatever. We may tackle that a little bit, but that that's the part we're hoping to to not avoid because it's a question. But we'll we'll hit on a little bit. So, Sean, how are you creating your RSS feeds? I guess I could I should be able to guess this one, but. Eh, you never know. Yeah, yeah, it's probably pretty obvious. I am using PowerPress, but I will say this. When I started podcasting, as I said, I was using a movable type installation, and this was back in 2005, and RSS was like I had no idea how that worked. So fortunately, it wasn't uh, long after I started podcasting that FeedBurner, back when it was a startup, they actually added... Uh, the podcasting support into it. So I started using FeedBurner at that point because it was just easier for me to manage. I, I didn't have to worry about trying to figure out how to make, you know, podcast feeds work inside a movable type. And then I was at pretty much just doing that. And then in 2007, I switched over to WordPress and was using PodPress until PowerPress came out and I switched over to that. So while I have been, you know, working with the Blueberry support team for about 10 months now. You know, I've I was using the plugin for years before that and I don't really think I'd use anything else going forward even if tomorrow, you know, I I was no longer with the the company, so. Why well, do yeah. I feel like you've been there longer than that? <laughs> it, it, I I don't know why. I just feel like you've been there forever. <laughs> I I'm not sure. I I'm kind of like I'm kind of like some weird you know, uh, podcasting fly on the wall or podcasting kudzu or something. I just, I tend to be around where podcasters are. And I've always been interested in the technical stuff. So even before I was doing this support work in kind of an official state, I just always like to help people. So I guess that might be why. I don't know. Yeah, it's probably it. You've been around the community, I'm sure, since before yeah. that. So that's, and that's probably part of the reason you're on the team. So uh, SP, what, uh, how are you creating your feed or feeds? I love being tail end Charlie in this discussion because I'm definitely the least experienced person when it comes to RSS feeds here. I am a hobby podcaster. I really don't have time to go in and create my own feeds or hand code them or whatever. So on my main podcast, I use Libsyn. Now, I would love to branch out and use Blueberry, and I'm kind of kicking myself that I didn't on the last podcast I started. But I like the feed on Libsyn because aside from the main RSS feed, you can also use other destinations which come into play. It actually came into play when I wanted to take a little diversion on one of my podcasts and I didn't want it out on the main RSS feed. So I put it out to secondary feeds, but I didn't put it out to the main feed and I was able to use that option in Libsyn. But more, probably more importantly, you probably had me on because I also use Spreaker. Now, I use Spreaker because I can broadcast the live shows, but also then those live shows stay on because I'm a hobby podcaster. I don't have time just to quick edit the podcast and get it out. So sometimes it's a few days before it gets out, but I deal with time sensitive content. So you're talking TV shows, you're talking uh, relevant geek news of the day, that sort of thing. So it's nice to be able to have that content available to the listener right away. And the way they can do that is to subscribe to the RSS feed for the particular show on Spreaker. So that is what we use it for in particular is, is a, uh, a live feed. And then Spreaker gives the wonderful option to replace the audio when I get it audited, edited, audited, audited too. You know, there's a lot of money changing hands during the podcast. And so it is replaced, and uh, I ha have the good feed up there. And so I like that option. It gives the maximum flexibility to our listener. And if they're really techie in the know and got to know now, they can go and listen to the podcast live. If not, they can just wait for the RSS feed to come out. So that is the mix of feeds that we use. Yeah, I, I do like the replace feature, and Libsyn has a replace feature, which I really love. And I imagine if you want to replace a file via PowerPress, See, right? The, prob I mean, the, the problem with the replace field in Libsyn isn't with Libsyn, but it's to some of the destinations that it goes out to, like mm. Stitcher. You can't replace the Stitcher file. The, the, the file that goes out, if, if it's on the main RSS feed, the file that goes out to Stitcher is the file that they have forever. It's because so, they take it. It's because yes. they take Google Play is going to do the same thing. Right. Which is a problem. 
So that is why I, again, like using the Spreaker option because I can have the live feed out there, the, the dirty audio, whatever, and then replace it with clean audio to go out forever on those platforms like TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Play. Hmm. Interesting. And what are, is that the big difference you see between running feeds through two different services? That's uh, what we use it for now. Like I said, I wish I, I have six total podcasts that I distribute in. I wish I would have gone with another uh, provider for the last one just to test the waters out on Podbean or Blueberry or, or whatever. But I, I'm really comfortable with Lipson as a hobby podcaster. It's the Cadillac Gold Standard that you can sign up for and you never have to worry about anything. And from what I hear, Blueberry is the same thing. But as far as the RSS feed, Chris will love this. I went in once to take a look at the RSS feed and it just boggled my mind, everything that's in there. <laughs> And I, I think I almost wanted to change something. I'm not a dumb person, by the way. I, I'm a rocket scientist, literally. I have a degree in it. But I just don't want to, I don't have the time to learn about it because I'm busy. I work a full-time job. I'm, I have six different podcasts. So I, I just want it to work. And Lipson makes it work for me. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that, I mean, I guess a couple of us are going through services. So I also use Lipson. I host on Lipson and I create feeds through PowerPress. But you don't want to do things the way I'm doing them right now because <laughs> um, yeah it's a bit of a it's a bit of a hack job so once you get too far down the road things can be difficult um, even when you have great services so uh, also if you're trying to squeeze the most money out of one service yeah, you make things a little difficult <laughs> so well, we won't go into that but we're all so a couple of us are using services and we mentioned a couple other services I think uh, let's see who Jason Olivio Olive, I think Olivia. I'm gonna go to Olivia. I think I'm saying that wrong. But he asks, "What do you think of Squarespace's offerings?" And I think Squarespace is, um, uh, while they haven't embraced it enough, like you, they're the ones who advertise on podcasts. They're known for it, and they don't curate the ability to have a podcast on their system well enough. But it has gotten better. I think it actually can be a legit option if you pay for their hosting. I mean, you're paying at that point for your website, and it's really good. And you can host your feed there now, right? So, and they have a redirect option. So, is that any for anyone have experience with Squarespace? Before I move on from that, I don't have any experience with it personally, but I do know that throughout the course of this year, they have improved mm -hmm. their RSS support. I know uh, Evo Terra was really kind of you know right. haranguing them all over. The social internet earlier this year, trying to get them to, you know, make their uh, RSS uh, podcast feed actually up to the full spec. So, I guess prior to the changes they made, it was it was fine for iTunes, and it would probably work some other places. But like it, Stitcher didn't like it, so you we know they couldn't import them at all. Yeah, we we would have people give the give us their feeds saying, "Can you import this?" And our feed importer wouldn't work. We had to rewrite portions of our importer to take their feeds. Hmm. So tough if you maybe want to make a change, but yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, when we're deciding where to make our RSS feed, that's a huge decision, right? I mean, because it, like I said, it without a RSS feed, you don't have a podcast. It's the core. It's everything that your podcast is. It's that one piece of code that has all the information about your show, and it's where it's basically your address where you send out. Uh, you know, to iTunes, to Stitcher, to anywhere you want to submit your podcast, you sit, submit your RSS feed, which is, you know, much different than I remember back in video podcast days where I had to upload the video file each time, like log in to new video hosting site, upload audio, man, you just give the RSS, you're done, you move on your way. Uh, so related to that, I mean, and we talked a little about feed, but actually let me rewind, rewind a little bit. What's the difference between your original RSS feed and feed burner, since there are several people still using it, even on this roundtable, a couple people still using feed burner. Daniel, what's the difference between what I guess feed burner calls your originating feed and feed burner? For me, nothing, because okay. I'm using feed burner in its very vanilla state. Now, I use feed burner with its C name option, so even the URL I'm using, it's a little bit te technical, but the URL that I use is not feeds.feedburner.com. It's feeds.a domain I own and then all of that. So even if FeedBurner were to die, I could still use it. But you compare my feed on FeedBurner to my source feed, 
it's going to look, I think, almost exactly the same. Right. And so back in the day when uh, if Dave was here, he would say that much better. Dave is on the road. Unfortunately, he's not with us today, but maybe he's listening on the road. Dave, drive safe, buddy. No, just keep looking straight. Stop looking at your stereo and your dashboard, <laughs> Dave. Stop it. He's talking to us. You know, he's, he's like, I want to say back. Anyways, so, you know, back in the day when I used FeedBurner, because I did do the blogger thing, um, you know, what I really loved about it was it sort of was like a facade for your feed where I could work behind the scenes and make changes. And then FeedBurner didn't change. iTunes would look at FeedBurner and then FeedBurner would say, oh, Ray did something in the background look over here. But iTunes didn't know that. It just looked at FeedBurner. But so FeedBurner sort of gets, it's sort of a middleman on some level. And like you said, I think we mentioned that it used to supply those iTunes tags for something like Blogger. So you needed it. But uh, how relevant is FeedBurner anymore? I mean, if people are starting a podcast today, I don't think anyone here, even though we're using it, is putting people on FeedBurner, are they? I'm a big fan of kind of assessing, you know, where people want to start and what they want to achieve. I would usually not suggest FeedBurner to start, but if someone says to me, oh, I, you know, I, I absolutely can only, you know, run my originating site on Blogger. It's the only way I'll do it. I won't do anything else. Well, then they're going to have to use FeedBurner or some other, you know, CMS that doesn't really output its own, you know, usable podcast feed, or maybe they're just really want to do it on a hobby basis, and they're kind of really just testing the water. They're not sure what they want to do, and they might change providers down the road. Well, you know, FeedBurner is great for that. I mean, I, I talk about my own experience where I went from movable type to WordPress and I didn't lose any of my subscribers because obviously those two systems handle feeds differently so I was able to just change my source feed and feed burner and everything pretty much stayed the same so it does still have some advantages I just think the problem that we run into now is there's so much older and maybe outdated information online that when people just go to a search engine and type out a podcast they're seeing all these tutorials that say use FeedBurner, use FeedBurner, and they're, they're kind of automatically being led into it. And while it can be good, it also does have its problems, and then we wind up having to try to fix those later. So, I mean, it, it does still have its uses in some cases, but I don't think it should be as primary a, of a consideration as it might have been yeah, seven, eight, ten years ago. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like when it comes to how to podcast, who ranks better in Google? And then that's the information you get. You should be forced. If you rank in the top five, you need to be forced to put out uh, update your information. Even myself on the Podcaster Studio, uh, if I refer people to really the basics episode, I say, hey, skip the part about feed burner. I mean, if you're going to, in general, people come to me and they say, you know, I want to start a podcast, like I need a feed, I um, need a host, all that stuff. And it's like, you know, do you are you already on WordPress? Is that what you're going with? Then you may want to consider PowerPress. I definitely PowerPress. I mean, I use it even if I don't use Blueberry, which I don't. I still use PowerPress. I think there's a differentiation there to make between what the plugin can do for you. It doesn't, you don't have to host. That's a nice thing about PowerPress. It's free. It adds a lot of functionality to your WordPress uh, website. I know Libsyn's coming out with their own plugin, so that's cool too. But you can skip a step, um, maybe. So depending on workflow, maybe. Uh, if you're on WordPress again, I'm going to say go to PowerPress. But then there's questions like, you know, I I don't want to maintain a WordPress website, right? So Lipson can be much easier <laughs> for someone who, you know, SP says he doesn't have time to really do all that. I mean, most of us don't. We do have full-time jobs and maintaining websites or, you know, fixing broken feeds, that stuff can take a lot of time. So, uh, or if you want an app, you might have to make consideration there. So different things to think about when you're choosing sort of a, a host. I mean, a host and a feed seems kind of tied together at some point, right? I mean, is that true? I mean, we get in this argument of owning your feed. And, you know, if we had Todd here, he would he would go crazy and say you, you have to own your feed. And that the only way you can do that is, uh, I guess, by having your own domain. But we've heard, if you listen to the feed podcast... Uh, Rob's talked about how, you know, Linlibsyn, you can uh, you can have your own URL. And basically, you own that slug you buy. So personally, Libsyn and Blueberry make it very easy. I don't have enough experience on the other platforms. I know people are doing everything from hand coding. Who hand coded their feed? That's what I want to know. I actually had to do that a little bit at work when we started. 
uh, what was it called? Feed for all you would use. I actually, I used feed for all, tossed it to the side and literally just went to the code because it was easier. So nobody here ever dug their hands into the into the code. Come I on. I brought up a couple of RSS feeds when I first started and I was like, no way. I just, I, <laughs> I, I can't, like I said, I'm not dumb. I can get into it. But if I can have somebody else manage it, that's, that's great. Matter of fact, I'm part of a network because I don't want to have a website. I don't want to maintain the website. So our uh, network owner, Stephen, I was talking to him about this today and he said, yeah, I self host right now through PodPress. And then he said, you know, if I had to do it over again, uh, because we're using Libsyn on one of our newer podcasts, he's like, I absolutely would go to one of the media hosts that have their RSS feeds because I, I just don't want to deal with it. It's just an extra hassle. I want to be creative. I want to get that, that I want to have the fun with the podcast. I want to get it out for the listeners. And it, it's just an extra hassle that you don't really need in this day and age. But I have a couple of questions for you guys since you're all Perfect. very experienced. With this. And, and the first one I have is if I was running my own website and I had a podcast on there and it was also a blog, can I have an RSS feed for the blog as well as the podcast on the same page on the same website? Yeah. Uh, and PowerPress gives you this ability built in that when you install PowerPress, you get a new RSS feed. Most people aren't using this because they've been given bad advice to use a category feed, but you can use slash feed slash podcast is the default that you get from PowerPress. And that's a podcast only RSS feed. So you can set the title for that, the number of episodes that will be displayed in that. You can change all of the information about that feed through PowerPress. And then your regular um, myawesomepodcast.com slash feed URL is everything else from your RSS feed, your, um, your any custom post types that feed to it, your blog posts, your podcast episodes, all of that. Daniel, do you own myawesomepodcast.com? Yes, I do. Okay, because you see, that's the one you use all the time. I figure he must own it, right? You and know, does it does a redirect. Um, no, it's it's a dummy site I play <laughs> with. Um, crazy thing, Dave Jackson actually registered it because I oh, was that's right. using that as an example for a while. He registered it. and He gave it to him, you? Yeah, he, well, he nice. sold it to me for the oh, good registration price. But Good job, Dave. Look at the road, buddy. Look at the road. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> Good times. Hey, so, okay, let's rewind. What are, what's important? What's the most important thing to think about when you're starting a show and you're going to, you're looking to create an RSS feed? This is very confusing. Like, you know, this is part of probably one of those things that makes podcasting not the easiest thing to get into, but it can be, but what's more. So let's, I'm trying to steer away from, hey, just get Libsyn. Yes, that's true. Make it super simple. But What's important when we're choosing, you know, I don't know. Do we have to think about choosing a host here? We kind of do. But what's important really. when we're looking? Okay, good. What's hey, important? Your, your RSS feed doesn't have to be tied to your host. Now, obviously, through Lipson, that's exactly what we do, what we advocate. And by that, I say we because I work for them. But as a person, you, your RSS feed is not tied to your host. And if I were to say that there are two uh, absolutely most important things you must know when you're picking how and who is going to create that RSS feed for you, uh, the one would be that the feed needs to be valid. Uh, it needs to work. It needs to work in iTunes. It needs to work in Stitcher. It needs to be coded valid. If it's not valid, it's not going to work. And the other thing is that you need to be able to move your feed. Now, some people say that you need to have it on your personal domain name. Some people say as long as you can add the redirects, I'm one of the latter. Uh, you mentioned Todd and Rob kind of like to banter back and forth, but really, as long as you can move your feed, and it's valid. Those are the two most important things in my book. What awesome. I would say, kind of put, uh, putting what Crystal said in a slightly different way, is I would say control. You need to have control mm -hmm. over the feed. So yes, to be able to redirect it if you need to someday. But not only redirect it, because, hey, you can redirect a SoundCloud feed. Well, that you have to pretty from. soon. Well, you need the new URL <laughs> tag. You need yeah. the 301 yeah, well, redirects. There's a couple pieces to that. <laughs> but um, what you don't get on something like a SoundCloud feed is you don't get a lot of control. Like if you want to change the publishing date for an episode, you can't do that. If you want to really optimize your SEO for uh, your podcast, you can't do that with SoundCloud. You can do that with Libsyn, with uh, PowerPress feeds, with Spreaker feeds. There are good systems out there. So that's the main thing is, do you have control to move 
to change, to use it in the best way possible. What's the one thing I think a beginner, their immediate thought is how much, right? I don't think they think of these issues and that's when they get into trouble later when they try to do something differently. So we're telling you these are important, but how important, why are they important? Um, you know, SoundCloud, someone's there because that's what they've decided they can afford. You What's know, the I, real cost? I, I, I go back to just thinking about sort of the, the first level of this is where are you sort of starting with publishing your content? So are you willing to, you know, roll a, a self-hosted WordPress site? I, I helped someone earlier this year migrate a podcast into the Blueberry.com system because she had a website, her website, like her .com, is on Wix, and she did not want to move. And I didn't know really how to make Wix support a podcast, and she had tried with not very much success to sort of create this thing, podcast system for herself, where she was using WordPress.com and FeedBurner, and I tried to go in and make that work for her, and it kind of did for a little while, and finally she said, look, I, I just need a better solution. So, you know, we moved her over to, to Blueberry.com, and she's got a feed over there, and that's working great for her now. But I think what I would always do is just start with that. So, you know, do you want to run, you know, do you want to roll your own WordPress installation? Do you want to use, you know, CMS X for your site? Okay, what are your options from there? And then what are you willing to do as far as hosting? How much money are you willing to spend? All that kind of stuff. And then you can kind of build it out from there and hopefully find kind of the, the best solution, the happy medium for whatever works for them. Because as we know, there's rarely a one size fits all answer to the question. You know, here's a, here's a crazy take on this. And this might be Dave Jackson inspired. Don't think about your feed until you have eight episodes recorded. The stats are most podcasters don't make it past episode seven. So how about you make sure that you can stay with this and get eight episodes recorded and ready to publish on a regular basis. And then you can think about where your feed will be generated because then it will actually matter and you won't be just putting a feed out there that then you stop podcasting after one episode. Well, so you not not all podcasters start out from the ground zero. There are some people that guest on multiple shows. They're they're co-hosting or whatever, and maybe they're producing their first podcast, and they know they're going to last longer than eight shows, and and they know that they're going to be in it for the long haul. And you have to give them the right advice too, of saying, look, you need to think, or maybe they are already thinking about the future and go from there. So, well. It I think if you look at, hmm, I, I, I don't like to look at costs as the primary consideration because no. there, well, Lipson starts at $5 and up. Um, Blueberry, if you have a self-hosted WordPress site already, um, which you can get, you know, GoDaddy has pretty, pretty good prices. Bluehost has pretty good prices. And you put oh, a self-hosted WordPress site there and you install Blueberry, the plugin doesn't cost a thing. So you can start out at a very good price point, a very minimal price point, and still do it right and still maintain control. The problem comes in when you have somebody new who thinks, I really don't want to pay, um, you know, I'm trying to pinch my dollars, and they end up going somewhere where moving away is a problem. And they do that a year, a year and a half later, and then they end up losing literally everything that they've spent that year trying to build up because they didn't know they were going to stick with it or they didn't know any better based on advice that they received that may or may not have been accurate. I think price point, I listed two two things. I would think price point would be actually number three because the other two can be received at very low cost, if any at all. Yeah, that's awesome. So, I mean, the free podcaster in that case, then how are, how are you setting up their feed? Feed burner is a good uh, option. Yeah. I, think I mean, for... at least then you have some control and you can still move it. I mean, I'm not the world's biggest advocate for FeedBurner for the same reasons Daniel brought up earlier. SmartCast can break things. Uh, the, the, the stats can break things. But 
at least then you can still move. Um, and that seems to be the number one issue is they get stuck in with a host that doesn't let them move because they were cheap. How much do most places now let you move? I know we put, I, th I feel like as a, as a, as a niche, as a medium, whatever, we've pushed pretty hard about this redirect thing. And like, I know that some are better than, than they used to be. I know that starting on blog talk radio used to be a, a bad thing. Like you could still get trapped is. there. Oh, it still is. All right. I, so I just get, I did a course, uh, a beta run last fall, last fall, this, this last, like two months ago. And, um, the experience that I'm speaking from is actually this one woman who ran a show for a year and a half on blog talk radio and trying to move off of blog talk radio, take her files, have the encoding that she wanted, do all the ID three tags, redirecting feeds. It was impossible. And she's still working on it today. Mm. It's just, it's not always as easy as plugging in the 301 redirect and a new feed URL tag and calling it a day. Seeing that uh, Jason here said, <clears throat> let's say you're doing a podcast, something happens in professional life, saps your monetary resources. How do you recover your feed if you had to let it lapse because of a time off? Should you get a new feed or should you try to do everything you can to restart the old feed? I'm not sure how you lose it. And maybe he's talking about like maybe you're hosting on lips and maybe that's what he's saying. You run out of money. I know there's you can downshift into a cheaper plan, but you'd never lose you never lose your feed URL, right? Uh, Crystal? Well, the feed URL, yeah, if or you're referring to slug. Lipson specifically, yeah, the, the show slug is always going to be unique to your right. show. It can never be reused by anybody except you. We can reactivate the show. We may not always have the media. You know, if we're talking a year, two, three, four years out, we may not have the media anymore, but we certainly have the slug we can re-enable. The real issue is that after a little while, iTunes will pull your show, and iTunes doesn't have a very nice resubmission process, uh, so <laughs> if any at all. So that's that's where you really get burned. It, it isn't so much with the host. If, as long as you know you can recover the feed, that's all well and good, but you have to worry about the podcast directories too. That's a good question as well. How often do you have to publish something on your RSS feed to keep it active mm. on different uh, directories or or readers or whatever for your podcast. Nice job. SP just earned his entire pay, pay right there. Like the checks Gold in the mail, star. man. That's a good question. Yeah, I didn't have that down. I don't think it matters to anyone except, as far as I know, except iHeartRadio. iHeartRadio will remove your show if it hasn't received a new item within, I think, six or eight weeks. Other than that, no one, as long as your feed does remain valid and it continues to be accessible and the media is accessible, no one will remove the podcast. I um, heard that iTunes had start, started doing that. Did I hear wrong? They have started cleaning out invalid feeds. Okay. And that's been happening for years, actually. They where, do that every so often. Yeah. If, if a feed is completely dead, the media can't be downloaded, anything like that, then there's no point in the podcast being there. But there have been a couple cases where I've helped some people who that happened to them. They didn't realize their feed was invalid for a couple months, and I fixed their feed for them. And then we contacted iTunes and said, hey, the feed is fixed. Could you please restore it? And they were able to restore it with all the ratings and reviews still intact. So you do have that option if your feed breaks and you fix it later. So if I pod fade a podcast and I'm using a service, whatever it is, and then go and just keep paying that, then for years later, that entire feed will still be available. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and in there, fact, there's, a, you know, Dan Carlin with Hardcore History releases how often, not very frequently, uh, Elsie Escobar with her uh, Yo Geek show. Yeah, I don't think she's released a new episode in something like three, <laughs> three years, years, but she's still one of the she's still one of the top yoga shows in iTunes. As long as that feed is live, it's good, it's valid, your artwork is good, you're good to go. What is, did you, did you guys cover the, um, when iTunes stops downloading it? Like if you're set to download new episodes, but new episode has not been uploaded for three weeks, Daniel, how does that work? So you're saying on the subscriber side? Yeah, on the subscriber side. If no new episode has been published and the subscriber has listened to the most recent episodes, nothing bad happens. So it's what is when, the deal? 
It's when a subscriber does not play one of the most recent, I think it's still at five episodes, and some other apps do this similarly or slightly different numbers. But if they don't play one of the most recently downloaded five episodes, their subscription is paused until they play one of those episodes, in which case their subscription is resumed and they pick up, not right where they left off, but they pick up with whatever is the most recent episode at that point. Yeah, okay. And then Angelo, do I dare go here? But yeah, I actually cleared up. It's, he, he mentions, he says, the biggest advantage to having the feed from your website is it keeps things tied together, that when you host on WordPress as your website uh, and PowerPress for your podcast, when someone clicks on a link, it goes to your site, not to someone else's service, which, you know, SoundCloud, you're probably a lot of times going to be taken to SoundCloud. So companies that host the feed on their .com in order to lock you into their service. And they benefit from the podcast traffic back to their .com rather than traffic going back to your site. Um, but I think Daniel and I talked a little bit about this, which is not, it's not the case. It doesn't have to be the case for Lipson, right, Daniel? Right. I'm letting no, Daniel is... answer the Lipson question, by the way. Even though, just <laughs> to remove fine. the bias. Just so it is the case with SoundCloud. There's no way right. to change that. So that's the thing about control. On the Lipson side and... Crystal can add a lot more details if she wants. But on the Libsyn side, you can change those things. You can change your podcast website, that little link that displays mm -hmm. on your iTunes listing. You can point that to wherever you want it to. That's important. That's an important link, you guys. Yeah. Like, make sure that that's going back to your website. And you should have a website in the first place. I mean, I think that's pretty key. Like, have a place that people can go back to. I click all the time to find more information, but keep going. Yeah, you can also change the individual items so that if someone is looking at the feed through some app that allows them to click through to the website, which there aren't who's many doing that. that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, who's <laughs> doing that? That's a big question. <laughs> but um, you can change it on Libsyn so it can go back to any site that you want to. The thing, though, is that to do that on Libsyn does mean extra steps for every individual episode. Doing that on your own website, you don't even have to think about it because it's just built right in. Right. And again, for me, it goes back to, I think each service in this case, those two, th those, are, those are my two, fit. those are the two that I recommend. And that's why I want to make sure that people know that you can use either one of those and be fine. You can hear the arguments for both. There's a lot of arguments. I feel like a lot of people, when it comes down to it, they end up choosing. If they've decided to invest in their show and they're going to pay for hosting, they're choosing between the two and they hear stuff and they think, oh, I, I can't do this or that. And it's a lot of myth out there. And so because those are the two I like to recommend because I think they're the best. You guys you guys are the best. You're in the community. Look, you're on Podcasters Roundtable. I, there was nobody for me to contact at SoundCloud to get on Podcasters Roundtable. That is not happening. Uh, Podbean, I wouldn't know who to contact. So this gets ugly. Again, we're talking about hosting versus feeds. But the point is, you're good there. I think in those two cases, you're good. But we will run into people who can't afford. And there's a lot of people who self-host, uh, meaning that they use their domain so they get their $5 Bluehost account. And then I assume at that point, they're maybe they're even using like a pod press or something. I don't know. Do you guys run into, Sean, do you run into those people who are self-hosting and then they decide that we might have slipped into hosting instead of RSS feeds, but they have an RSS feed and they want to like upgrade because they may have run into trouble um, with their host. Well, sure. I mean, I think any of us that, that work for a podcast hosting or podcast services company, whatever you want to say, you know, we're always running into situations where people need to migrate over to our companies for different reasons. And I mean, I'll admit there were some years in my, you know, time in podcasting when I self-hosted my files. I've always used DreamHost and either I've been lucky in that they didn't care or I've just not ever had a lot of downloads, probably mostly the second one. Um, but, uh, you know, you do hear those stories that from time to time where somebody just figures, okay, well, I'm already paying for web hosting. I know I can upload my files here, so I'll put my files here. And, you know, sometimes it works out okay, but the thing about that is, or the, the tricky thing about that is it's not designed to scale. So if suddenly you do get really popular and you do start serving a lot of files quickly, you know, if you're on a shared hosting account, that's just going to take everything down and they're going to uh, hopefully politely ask you to leave before they just kick you off. But uh, it, it, it does happen. And it is one of those things we kind of touched on earlier about 
working out the the price thing, and I love Crystal's you know list that putting that lower on the list should should really be the way people approach it. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't. So you you kind of have to to work around that where you can. And Daniel, you hit on this when we're talking about sort of advantages. We're talking about like what are you looking for when you're, you're starting to create your RSS feed? You're trying to figure out how you're going to do that. Am I going to get a Libsyn account and just do Libsyn and then have a website? Or am I going to get a website, put PowerPress, new Blueberry and all that stuff? SEO. Uh, in SoundCloud, you say you don't really have control over SEO for, for your RSS feed. What do you mean by SEO? It's, it's a bit jumbled bunch of code. Like, what do I have access to? <laughs> well, everything about your podcast SEO in iTunes, in upcoming Google Play, in any podcast app, all of your search engine optimization comes from your RSS feed, not your ID3 tags, not directly from your website, unless your website is the thing generating the RSS feed. But the point is basically it's your RSS feed that sets your search engine optimization, not your website, not your media files. And so if you don't have full control to leverage that, especially the only two fields that iTunes indexes for search, then you can be really missing out on the opportunity to make your site or your podcast more findable in iTunes and other podcast apps. I do have a complete SEO for podcasters course, blah, blah, blah. There's that. You can check that out. But the main thing is, do you have control, full control over your show title, your episode titles, your show author tag, and your individual episode author tags? If you don't have full control over that, then you're missing out on search engine optimization. PowerPress, Libsyn uh, give you control over that. I believe Spreaker does give you control over that, even on the episode level for the author tags. But many other places don't. And that's a, that's a good thing because we talked about, uh, it's a good topic because we talked about uh, iTunes tags and FeedBurner and you had to use FeedBurner to get the tag. What are the tags? Like when we're talking about feedburner, for someone, not feedburner, but we're talking about an RSS feed, someone new who's listening to this and they're trying to figure out RSS feeds. Why did we have, what was the difference between an RSS feed and iTunes tags? What are those tags? I mean, who wants to jump in on that? Messy. I'll take a shot at it. I've learned, I've learned more about RSS in the last 10 months than I knew in the previous <laughs> 10 years. And when... You know, when RSS first started, and, and, and this is kind of the thing, like if you look at any RSS feed, a podcast feed, whatever it is, in Google Chrome or Firefox, actually no, I take that back on Firefox, but definitely if you look at it in Google Chrome, and you don't have any other, you know, extensions, whatever, that are there to specifically massage your RSS or fire off some secondary app or whatever you'll see the, just the pure source code of your feed. And, you know, so that began as, as kind of a, a, I don't want to say simple, but maybe not complex way to just have a, a simple text feed that has all the information, you know, sum, summarizing information from whatever website it is. And from my recollection, RSS kind of grew up around blogging and then, of course, we sort of picked it up as, as podcasters. And when Dave Weiner created the RSS 2.0 spec, he added in the stuff for media enclosures. So that was, you know, the enclosure URL, the uh, file size, and the file length. And I don't know for sure if there was anything else there. And then when iTunes came in, they added their, their own stuff to the RSS 2.0 spec because RSS is open source, so they could do that. And, you know, some RSS feeds... Like, there are still sites that will give you RSS 1.0 feeds that don't have any of that stuff if you just want a more simple feed, whatever. So the, the iTunes stuff is the stuff that's relevant really only to iTunes, though a lot of the other podcasting apps now use that, and that's things like your iTunes image, um, you know, uh, your, your iTunes author, stuff like that. I don't know them all off the top of my head, but that's where that stuff comes in. So it's kind of... Like, if you wanted to, you could create an RSS 2.0 spec without the iTunes stuff. And if you manually subscribed to that RSS 2.0 feed, provided it was valid, it would actually work in, you know, the iTunes desktop app, probably most decent podcasting apps, because there would still be enough basic information in there that the app could look at the feed, 
find the enclosure, know where to download the file. But if you wanted to get into iTunes, then a lot of the other directories that now use, you know, pull from the iTunes tags, it wouldn't work. They would reject it. And Google Play has now added, you know, a few of their own tags. And I don't know if their plan is to add more down the road. But in theory, any service that wanted to, you know, work with podcasts or really any other kind of, you know, uh, RSS media, whatever it is, they could add in their own set of tags and we'd have to find ways to implement those depending on if we wanted to join those services or not. So that's another issue, right? I mean, I know Blueberry and Lipson were quick with the Google tags. Like you can now put those tags and you could be on a service that doesn't react like that because they're not a podcasting service, right? They're not built for podcasters. So you're like, I can't add these Google Play tags. I mean, what are those tags? Crystal, I mean, first of all, is this a mess? I mean, that people are coming in and adding more tags. Is that a potential problem or is it just something that is an added benefit if you have them, it's nice? We don't even know what the advantage is going to be of those tags, do we? Uh, it, it's really just Google kind of creating their own tags, uh, like category. You know, Sean was talking about the, the tags from the RSS tag standpoint, but when you go into your WordPress site, if you're running Blueberry and you create a post and you enter a title, there's your episode title. You enter your blog post stuff, your what many people call your show notes, that's your description. You upload your media file, that's your enclosure. So we talk about them in terms that are much different than say as you, if you're looking at the services dashboard as you're filling the stuff out. So if you were to actually, as he mentioned, open up an RSS feed in Google Chrome, a lot of people get confused because they're like, oh, I see all of this text. Why is my RSS feed not working? No, it's working perfectly. Um, but if you just take a moment, get away from the panic and look, you'll see things like iTunes colon summary, iTunes colon author iTunes colon category. So in Libsyn, when you're filling out your RSS feed and you're filling in that category field, that's iTunes colon category. That's your tag. Now, if you were to look at a Google Play Music feed, that's actually a Google Play colon description, a Google Play colon category. So they, they did the same thing. They just removed iTunes and put Google Play in it. Now, if you take that feed and you run it through Feed Validator or other W3 uh, styled service, it's going to go, ah, that is not a valid feed. Mm -hmm. Well, to Google it is. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so valid, it, it, I, the Feed Validators, this is an important point. The Feed Validators will if they say it's invalid, that's one thing, but they'll often give warnings about interoper interoper <laughs> say it. interoperability. It yes, thank you. Um, it will give those warnings, and, and that's when it sees stuff that it doesn't recognize, but what invalidates a feed does still break it. So as, as long as your feed says it's valid, that's fine, but if it gives all these warnings, which it will on all of these Google Play feeds, then that's um, okay. So I think it's uh, also worth noting, I'm, I'm sorry to, to interrupt you, SP, but I think it's also worth noting that when Google Play launched, they they were accepting, you know, the iTunes tags iTunes. initially. And, you know, we all, that we kind of didn't all have the spec, I think, yet. I could be wrong about that. But since then, Ray, as you've said, you know, mo most of the, the services have added those tags in and you can just fill out the, the fields as needed depending on which service you're using, but when it first launched, they were actually being nice in that they were just going, okay, we we recognize it, this iTunes spec and we'll work with that while we're getting started instead of just going, no, we're Google, that's Apple, we've got to have our, you know, our whole other set and you've got to do it exactly the way we want it or we're going to kick it out. So there was that at the beginning, and it's possible now that they're still accepting feeds without the Google stuff in them, I can't yeah. say for sure. Yeah, and part of it could even be that they simply don't want to use someone else's trademark in their own stuff. So if there's ever a legal issue to say, hey, wait a minute, you can't build your house on our foundation, well, they can say, oh, we're not. Look, we have our own tags. We're, we don't have to use the iTunes tags. People can use the Google Play tags. Yeah. I just wonder how this is going to play out long term. Uh, it, 
most podcatching directories were perfectly okay with taking a valid iTunes styled feed and that kind of became the de facto standard mm -hmm. and then Spotify came along and we all got really excited about Spotify and that's that's great whatever they're doing with their beta hey you know For those mm. that are actually on but it. Yeah. <laughs> right right yeah. but you know they're they're doing their submissions they're very slow and editorialized way um and now google play is coming along and they've got their own rss feed spec and they're taking their own rss feed so as more and more um companies and services come on board and accept uh podcasts for their directories and we're all excited because we want our podcasts to be findable searchable and that's great how much more difficult is it going to be to be creating all these, as we call them, destinations in Libsyn, um, you know, and for, for Blueberry and other services to, to, we, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Blah. SP, you were going to say something before. Did you, do you remember that thought or? I, I absolutely do. Sean actually stole my thought. My, my, what I was going to say was that, Google Play Music was accepting RSS feeds, so they're obviously doing some sort of machine-to-machine -machine translation from the normal RSS feed with the iTunes tags, whatever, in there to whatever they're doing. And uh, they're going to have to accept those feeds that they accepted initially for a very long time. So they're going to have to do this transcoding for what is a normal RSS feed and not a GPM feed or what, whatever it's called for them for as long as they have RSS feeds coming in. So I, I would say that if you have an RSS feed and you have submitted it, I wouldn't worry about it today. Awesome. Well, I mean, we are wrapping up. I don't think we exhausted this one. So it always leaves room to, to revisit. Extra content is good when you're creating episodes. We're on 62 here. We're climbing the ladder, doing good. Uh, SP will come back and he'll have a second shot. <laughs> and maybe some I of the will? stuff he actually listed. Yeah, yeah, I think you passed. I think you passed. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I'll let him talk about some of the stuff he actually listed. So go to podcastroundtable.com. You will get put on to the email list, and then you'll get a form that says, hey, here's the stuff I have experience with when it comes to podcasting. Here's the stuff I'd really love to talk about. <clears throat> and then I'll go to that, and we'll create a topic, and we'll roll with it, and we'll get you on here. So Thanks, everybody, for joining me. We're going to go down the line. Uh, let us know where to find your podcast. If you have any closing remarks about RSS feeds, feel free to interject those. Uh, and then we will head out here. I, I, am, I am curious, though, again, for the new person or even the experienced podcaster who's like, ah, I've been doing it this way, but I'd like to do it, quote, unquote, right. What do you need to make sure? I guess we're going to tackle them before we go to outros. You know, that doesn't have to be an outro. What do you need to make sure of? Maybe Crystal covered it. When you are creating an RSS feed, is redirect the ability to move that feed. So you decide you want to do Blueberry, then you decide Lipson, or then you decide your own hope. Whatever you decide, what gives you the most control? Because the control is really an important issue here, right? And we tackled this, I think it was the very first roundtable. It's called like ownership of your podcast or something. It's kind of where we talked about that. So if you want more of this, go to round one. But I mean, does anyone want to jump in there? And Crystal, you may have covered that already. I think maybe, I mean, it has to be valid to work. And then I think you, you hit it with the redirect, right? I think so. Anybody else want to jump in on that? <laughs> anyone else have something else that's just so vital? I mean, Daniel, your SEO thing, that was pretty important. So I guess maybe it's more of a recap than it is a question. I'll throw, in, I'll throw in one piece of advice. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Daniel, but uh, I'll throw in uh, one piece of advice just from my own experience over the last year or so, and, and that is, you know, if, if you are using uh, WordPress to generate your feed, your, your podcast feed, um, just try not to make your site overly complex because sometimes – you know, adding in too many plugins and variables is when you start to have weird things happen pretty much anywhere on your your site, but that can include your podcast feed. So wherever possible, you know, keep it simple. That's it. I cannot agree with that more. Please amplify <laughs> that. That yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, the more the more you throw into the mix, the more likely it is you're gonna you you can break something. I mean, it's that simple and you know, I mean, SP, you don't want to be fixing stuff. You may, you don't have the time to go in and fix 
stuff, it gets in the way of creating content, right? Yeah, I, as I mentioned before, I did go into my RSS feed on Libsyn on a couple of occasions. I believe uh, Crystal was the one who had to bail me out because I think I changed <laughs> one thing that she had to go in and fix. That was about a year and a half ago, so thank you very much. But <laughs> yeah, there, there's about four different things that, that I learned in this episode that, that I want to reiterate here. Perfect. So the first is that RSS stands for Real Simple Syndication, right? <laughs> <laughs> the second ah, is okay. that it is important for all new podcasters to hand roll their own RSS code. Yes. The third is to use SoundCloud as their hosting <laughs> yes. site. Mm -hmm. And the fourth <laughs> is to copy all of Daniel's SEO RSS fields to get your maximum amount of SEO. Well, we yeah. know who won't be on the round table. Eh? <laughs> I love this guy. No t-shirt for you. <laughs> no t-shirt for you. No t-shirt for you. That, and that's gold. And if you've listened this far, you, then you're in deep enough to know, don't take SP's advice. Right? <laughs> Not on this topic already. Yeah. You're going to build a rocket. Yeah, maybe look him up. In a create an RSS that, feed, that maybe you want to go over it. it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. Daniel, thanks again for co-hosting duties, and we will see you next time. Thank you. I'm Daniel J. Lewis from the com. Awesome. Short and sweet. Like a pro. Crystal, thank you so much for coming back. Short notice. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Crystal O'Connor, over at Lipson. And uh, actually, I'm going to switch up the URL for change, lipson.com slash events we're getting out into a lot of educational webinars of course blabs lips and lives all that stuff and you can also catch me at bullettalkradio.com awesome very cool got our own show and show for work so lots of good stuff I going there it for a change, but we'll good see. job you gotta you gotta plug word of mouth <laughs> this is word of mouth hey sean thanks for joining us again also on short notice i appreciate it I'd like to bring in the ringers you guys you guys killed it as as usual Thank you, Ray. I'm Sean Thorpe, and I do work with the Blueberry support team, so you can find me in all the places where we're at, and you can find everything else I do in pretty easily in one place at my personal site. That's Sean, S-H-A-W-N dot M-X. Yeah, I'm looking forward. We, should, we need to do a round on um, like call to actions. I mean, we sort of did that, but like you've got one. I think we did this. So you got one chance to say one place to go. Where do you send people? Save it. That's for another round. SP, thanks for joining us so much. Your first round table, hopefully, yeah, it wasn't too bad. Oh, it was absolutely a joy being on here. I've been listening to you guys for a while in the gym. Every time I work out, I listen to a few podcasts. This is one of them. So thank you very much for having me. If you want to find me, you can search for gunnageek.com. We have 18 weekly, most of them, some bi-weekly geeky-related podcasts. And we're always looking for some new great content. So go to gunnageek.com slash about if you want to apply to be part of the network. Very cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. The chat, Chris Farrell, you kicked butt. Angelo Mandato, thank you so much. Uh, Stephen J hooked it up. Eileen is in the chat. Jason Olivio, as we mentioned. I'm probably saying that wrong. Scott, I'm going to murder that last name. So thanks, Scott. And uh, Robert Burris, who is, I believe, probably up in the middle of the night watching this. So thanks so much. Podcastroundtable.com. We'll see you on round 63. Wave goodbye, everybody. We are out of here. Where's the stop button? There it is. <laughs>